As I was sitting at the table tonight, I realized the tremendous advantage that David Dernberger had over the rest of us. He looks like a United States Senator. <laughs> it was by the calendar not so very long ago that David served as United States Senator from Minnesota. But in truth, it was an e a long time ago, a time of collegiality, a time of civility, a time of people working together for the greater good. He was a forceful, effective United States Senator from the moment he arrived on the scene. His first bill, the Women's Economic Equity Bill, eliminated discrimination against women legislatively or through regulation. Early on in 1979, In 1979, under his leadership, they passed a health reform bill, and for the next 15 years, every health reform bill in the United States Senate bore his name as an author or co-author. In every instance where there was something related to economic protection, environmental protection, David Dernberger was a leader. He was regarded to be one of the great experts dealing with federal and state relationships. He was a tax reform expert, and he believed in appropriations in the appropriate way, so he never forgot who sent him to the dance. And many of those, maybe all of the appropriation bills, had projects specific for the state of Minnesota. He was a man who collaborated with his colleagues a man who worked closely and patiently with all of them. But one should not forget that he was also a forceful politician when partisanship was necessary. And on the field of, ball of battle, he was a gifted gladiator. He won three times, three times he was elected to the Senate. And he defeated household names, short, Humphrey, and Dayton. That's a record. No Republican has ever won three times. And David, I want you to know that all of the Democratic activists here tonight are working aggressively to preserve your record. <laughs> I want to say one more thing about David. His life since he left the Senate has been one of impressive involvement in the world of public affairs and health care most of all. And we are very much in his debt for that. And finally, I tell you something that we are especially in his debt for. Through his eyes and through his speaking, we have seen the insight rarely given by a public figure as he re-examines his political loyalties, his political commitments, his political philosophy. That's not an easy thing to do, and it's a very important contribution to the state of Minnesota. I'm very proud to introduce David Dernberger tonight. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Please. Thank you. <laughs> to my family, and my friends who are here with us this evening, allow me to say thank you for giving me the, mo the opportunity, the motivation, and your time and talent to serve a unique, a unique Minnesota community during the past 50 years. 
To my colleagues at the Humphrey Th School of Public Affairs, thank you for the opportunity tonight to express my appreciation from, for all that you have taught me and you have taught others about the values of public service. And you chose an opportune time in the long history of public affairs in America to honor the five of us for addressing the world's most pressing problems. However, you have left us and others in this room a larger challenge, that of building hope and opportunity for future generations. In April, DFL biographer and humorist Norman Sherman emailed me as congratulations with this news, and I quote him. I can't be down, I can't be there, but I just got a message that Humphrey is smiling down on you in bipartisan approval. <laughs> I think Norm recognized I'd be up here tonight um, at a time when legislators inspired, representing a time when legislators inspired trust in the electorate by earning their confidence. Norm knew better than most that Hubert was successful when he was working with Republicans in the Senate. And I know from experience that the same bipartisan interdependence was true of Republican Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, because it builds trust in the people you serve. How well I remember the Democratic leader of the Senate, George Mitchell, whom you honored here several years ago, in 1999, on three different occasions, working either in his office or in Bob Dole's office, with two of us from each of the two political parties and people from President George Bush's cabinet to craft, first, the Civil Rights Restoration Act, secondly, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and third, the Clean Air Act. The CEO of a Minnesota family corporation known around the world emailed me last week, and I'll quote him. You made your political career by making compromise both possible and admired, which is a word I've never heard associated with <laughs> compromise. It's, it's really, it is really impressive and admired. Your agenda was always focused on what was best for Minnesotans and Americans. I hope you continue to speak for progressives and the silent majority that lives in the center, sometimes veering right on certain issues and sometimes left on other issues." End quote. When winning is everything and money is the principal means to that end, we've lost the trust of those we serve. And we've lost our ability to make America great again, to say nothing of our ability to make Minnesota partisan politics as beneficial to our common well-being as they once were, and our effectiveness, a national example of good governance. Partisan politics in the 21st century has not been kind to hope and to opportunity. But I, for one, have chosen to believe that we Americans are not sailing in uncharted waters, simply because we can't predict what Donald Trump will do or say next. We know what to do when it comes to taking back our own future from these kinds of politicians. We just haven't found a way to do it. So what better time than now to suggest that we don't have as far to go as we may think, to discover what's gone wrong in this country and in this state and what we should be doing about it. In November this year, it will be 50 years from the time a South St. Paul lawyer named Harold Vander, once a law partner of the 1938 Boy Wonder Governor, Harold Stassen, was elected the Republican Governor of Minnesota. He had a two-thirds majority of conservatives in the House of Representatives and nearly that in the Senate, which had been conservative ever since the end of party designation early in the 20th century. When the leaders of the 1967 legislature asked the new governor what he wanted them to do, he responded thusly, we passed the Republican platform into law. Now that's going to scare the hell out of some of you in this room. 
Six months later, the local media tells us, and I quote, nearly two-thirds of the Minnesota Republican Party's platform had become law, including the establishment of a Metropolitan Council in both Metro and Greater Minnesota regional development agencies that exist today, a State Department of Human Rights, a Department of Labor and Industry, and a Pollution Control Agency, increased state formula aid to public schools, the commitment to make higher education available within 35 miles of every Minnesotan, and that's not all in the Republican platform, in the state of Minnesota. One of those Minnesota... One of those Minnesota Senate leaders who was both Governor LeVander's campaign manager in 66 and mine in 78 is with us tonight, and I ask you to recognize now Paul, Albert, Paul Obergaard from Albert Lee, Minnesota, sitting right over here. This is not the work of a litmus test on life, guns, and health reform party, or a no new taxes pledge party, or a sub caucus social or cultural issues party. It's the work of what a Republican businessman tells me was then, as it remains today, the silent center of progressive Republicans and Democrats, the silent center, a majority of voters in Minnesota. Sam Kaplan and I are more than law school classmates and over the hill DFL and Republican office holders. <laughs> Sam says, speak for yourself. We are Minnesotans who still respect both our differences and our common interests in public and community service. Whether here or in Washington, we took on, in Minnesota, systemic problems created in part by public financing, or by, by policy like income tax, housing, health care, education, the environment, civil rights, and economic security. We brought to office our life experiences. We presented them to critical issues, like accountability, governance, leadership, and transparency. In Minnesota, we counted on socially responsible business leaders, like the gifted governor and university regent, Elmer L. Anderson, and the late and much-missed Wheelock Whitney. On a strong civic infrastructure, like the Citizens League, and on an unusual depth of journalism and media, we did it, and we can do it again. I know there are progressive voters in both parties. And I'm confident there is a silent majority that lives in the partisan center of determining a better role for government in solving our problems. I am as confident, I am as confident that we can take back our state and our nation again as I am confident that Jerry Brown makes a better California governor the second time around. <laughs> as I am confident that Ohio Congressman and then Governor John Kasich would probably make a pretty good president as I am that Chief Justice John Roberts can still find common ground in what some national partisans had hoped to make yet another ideological forum, as I am that not every Republican or every Democrat in the country has to change in order to change this country. Many thanks to one of the great institutions in this state, the University of Minnesota for the honor you've done each of us by making so much possible here that does not happen elsewhere. We can do it again. We are One Minnesota, a renewable resource. Thank you.